graduated, elevated. Now it's my time to shine, yeah, let's go. Graduated, elevated. Now it's my time to shine, yeah, let's go. Major moves. Hi and welcome to PhD Hard Talk. Thank you so much, Robin, for giving me your time. Could you please introduce yourself, um, university, your research, and then we can crack on. Yeah, hi. Thank you so much for inviting me to come along. I'm really excited. Um, so obviously I'm Robin um, and I've just recently started as a lecturer um, at Derby in criminology um, and my research is looking at universal credit um, and sort of the longitudinal aspects of that in the pandemic. Um, yeah, nice. Excellent. Thank you so much. I think you're the second person that I've spoken to from Derby University. I'm getting in there um, <laughs> in terms of re representation. So thank you so much. And I guess um, in terms of universal credit, um, for those who don't know what it is, who are not from the UK, could you please explain um, what that is and then we can go into our questions? Yeah, of course. Um, so it's sort of the latest in a long um it's the latest in welfare reform in the UK um, and what's really significant about universal credit is it's the first digital by default form of welfare we have here. So people apply online um, and it's managed online by sort of an online journal. So it's quite different to some of the other models of welfare that we've seen. Um, but in terms of conditionality and how people are sort of uh, managing this this is very much become intensified with the universal credit but it sort of falls on sort of you know previous systems um, but instead they've heightened some of the restrictions so there's things like in work condition conditionality now so people already in work can be subjected to certain conditions to be able to get the universal credit um, so that's sort of uh, an additional element of the system. Okay, so based on, on, on your research then, um, you know, I know that it was during the pandemic in terms of focus. Um, what, what did you find that was quite peculiar and interesting about universal credit? And I understand the journal system as well, that it was online. I think all of us were working from home. But what, what stood out the most? Because I'm thinking some people can't afford Wi-Fi. How do they then access their journals? Well, some people don't have smartphones. So what were the peculiar challenges that you found during that time? Yeah, that's that's a really interesting point. So sort of my sample, um, those issues didn't really come up as much as you might expect. Um, but I think some of the really peculiar things were so sort of when we had that first lockdown, um, people didn't have commitments, they didn't have work commitments. But as we sort of got to the winter period and we had multiple lockdowns, people were still expected to look for work. Um, for I had one participant who had to look for 20 hours a week, but they didn't have childcare. Their, their family support system wasn't available to sort of help with that. Um, and it, yeah, I just found that really peculiar that they were still expected to to search for work in that way, whilst on the other end of the spectrum, people were on furlough. Um, so I think that was that was quite surprising um, that it didn't really change that much. And also, um, so we had like the uplift. So everybody got an extra £20 a week on universal credit. Um, and there's, there's some other research out there as well that sort of looks at this. Um, but people's living costs were really increased during that period because um, they were shopping more locally, not wanting to you know, travel further afield to, to larger supermarkets. Um, and I don't really think that really sort of benefited them as much as perhaps we thought it would um, in, in that respect. So just for the audience as well, um, what are yeah. work commitments so that they're clear on that? Yeah, so um, we've we've seen it with sort of other forms of benefits before universal credit, um, but it's this idea of people having to um, follow certain rules um, in order to receive their welfare. Um, so these can range really, and it's very much dependent on how old. Um, this is another thing. All my research looked at uh, parents. So it very much depends on how old the children are that will determine sort of what's expected of you. Um, but it can be to varying degrees. It could be 20 hours a week or it could be 35 hours a week. Um, and it, it's kind of individualised on people's circumstances. OK, so during the pandemic, then um, you, we know that there isn't that much work and people are unfair, though, you've mentioned. Yeah. So how were they expected to find 20 hours of work when people are unfair, though? How did that work and what kind of work was it that they were expected to do? 
Okay, so some of my participants, um, they they weren't made to look for work whilst they were on furlough. What what I mean by that was, um, so I, I found it really interesting the disparities. So people who were on low incomes and struggled financially had to search for work, but those who were more wealthy or had um, employment opportunities um that that sort of changed and i found the disparity between sort of um the poor who was who were struggling and those who had more secure forms of employment weren't subjected to the same conditions and i found that that's the gap that i found really really sort of um and no one seemed to talk about that gap between the two two groups so when we look at and, and again we use this term loosely when we say that the, the, the poor in terms of that group so they're expected to find work for 20 hours which industries were available to take them on at that time or were there any government measures that were put in place to get them into work like working from home doing admin work or mm. were they just expected to find work without any other measures in place yeah, that's a really good point. So a lot of the work that was available from sort of participants perspective was care work um, and not not everyone felt comfortable doing care work. And the sort of the expectation was they had to take any work. They just had to keep applying and, and take anything that they could. Uh, there was there was no real support there from from sort of their experience. Um, it was just a case of applying for everything um, and they weren't really given skills like many, many of my participants said that, you know, they, they wanted CV support, you know, because they weren't getting interviews, but it wasn't offered, it wasn't available. OK, so let's focus to now um, mm -hmm. in terms of the situ then and current situ post pandemic. In, in your opinion, because I'm not I'm, I'm sure you haven't looked at it, but maybe you have, um, you know, the, the the reality which was you're expected to find work and we've got the you know the care work um that was available at that time because we know there was a shortage of you know um carers nurses etc and there still is a shortage now mm -hmm. when it comes to like cv support and getting people back into employment do you think the challenges that are there when you've been on universal credit um is it universal credit line they're still pertinent in the sense of you know, they're not really getting any support in terms of that group that we've mentioned, and therefore it's quite unrealistic in terms of the expectations. Or do you feel like they've the government's got it on point? <laughs> or is it DWP? They've nailed it, you know, it's right, we don't need anything to be improved. What's your take on that? Um, so I think that's a really good point. Um, I think one of the the big issues as well um, that I found in the research was childcare. So although we're sort of in the post pandemic period and people can sort of use family more if if they have family available, a lot of my participants didn't. Um, that's not really taken into account. So with universal credit, um, you get 85% of childcare that you pay um, back, but it's always in arrears. So you're always chasing this payment. So I think in terms of support, I think CV support um, will be beneficial. And I know there's there's different things available. Um, but what I also found is because it was sort of across the UK is it was very dependent on your location, the sort of support or um, response that you got it was quite different although it was a small sample it mm -hmm. did show that it was quite different so I, th I think maybe some sort of standard approach would be useful um, but I really think one of the key issues because sort of my my group looked at um, families is childcare that needs to be reconsidered um, there should be grants I think instead of sort of being paid in arrears for support um, and being accepting that people want to work around their families, it seems to have shifted away that sort of perspective now. Interesting. So you've mentioned something there and you yeah. said, um, you know, you, you looked at, you know, the, the, the whole of the UK um, per se, and there were certain places where the support was there. So which cities were those in terms of where the best support was based on your sample? Um, so it's a really small sample, so I'm not sure I can really, really answer that because um, there, yeah. there was, I think there was about six cities. So I would probably need to look at it in more detail, really, and probably get a larger sample um, to, to really answer that. OK, no, that's fine, because I was just thinking um, if, for example, it was Leeds, we'll pick Leeds mm. as an example. And, you know, in terms of the approach to which they followed, would that be the best fit then, in your mm. opinion, for the mm. whole of the UK? Or maybe we look at, you know, the north is different from, let's say, the south, mm. you know, the Midlands, etc. So I was trying mm. to, you know, to understand what the best fit 
would be in your opinion based on on your sample and your findings or you can just share your opinion in terms of what what you think would be best with the child care that is so a couple of my uh, participants were able to get this flexible support fund so that's like a grant you can get um, and it can help with things like um, childcare and things but the information's not really readily available a lot of people had to sort of fight to be able to get this so I feel like that should be more accessible at, at, at all places particularly for people who have sort of um, returned to work as well um, it's, it's quite hard especially if you've got nursery fees to pay that money up front um, so I think that could be one way to, to to do that. No, thank you. And I, I think you've highlighted something else. Sorry, I keep going back. No, it's um, okay. You know, in terms of information not being available. Mm. So, in 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 your opinion, and this is just your opinion, or maybe you've got the findings. What is the best approach when it comes to information? For example, some people don't even know that we've got the universal credit line, for example. How do we educate the communities in which we live in to say these, you know, facilities or services, they are available, you know, if you do want to get back into work. However, you know, when it comes to childcare, this these are the limitations in terms of what we can offer, you know, and then on the CVs as well, you can, you know, then share that you can work mm -hmm. biweekly or part time, you know, in terms of care work. I know you can do like bank shifts, etc. Um, admin work, I don't know if it, that would work essentially, but but again, that's limiting someone's career. But, you know, in terms of mm -hmm. options um, mm -hmm. you know, what's what's your take on that? Hmm. I think it's a really difficult one and I think a lot of the issues stem from the fact that the service is predominantly delivered online so whereas before with with sort of legacy benefits people would get that face-to-face -face contact more often whereas that doesn't happen I know we've sort of gone gone back to people having meetings in in job centres now but it's it's not as common as it, as it used to be and it's not as frequent so I think that that is an issue and sort of from my findings one way people sort of got, got through this was Facebook Facebook groups was a real real big um big way that people sought support from one another um, I'm not sure how you would do that structurally because if you spend time searching online you can find stuff but again from sort of participants experience it depends really on your area it depends on the the job coach that you get your work coach um, it can vary so much it's, it's really difficult to say um, thank you so much uh, for, for for sharing that. Now, going into, um, you know, your research, I always like to ask questions pertaining to the methodology, because I get, you know, a few DMs here and there asking about, you know, the approach is qualitative better than quantitative, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and so basically, what was the approach that you followed and why? So I did a qualitative approach. Um, I think for me, for this sort of research, I, I'm really interested in, in stories, you know, and that's what it was about, um, which is why I sort of use qualitative. Um, and I did a longitudinal approach and it was massively derailed by the pandemic um, because I was going to do focus groups. I was going to do so many things and it, it didn't happen. Um, but what I actually did end up doing was uh, phone interviews um, and that worked quite well. And I had sort of three different phases um, for the for the research. Um, and each phase was sort of marked by um, a lot of different lockdown period, which was really, really interesting as well. Um, and I also used diary entries. So I sort of had totally unstructured, just gave um, participants like an idea of um, just letting them tell me you know what interactions they've had um it was very very loose and I had quite a good response from that as well um and that worked really well and I also did um auto ethnography um as someone who's sort of a member of that group uh, claiming universal credit um so I sort of incorporated that into the thesis as well which I did really struggle with how to navigate that but I felt it was important to be transparent no, thank you. And I think that links into my other question. But yeah. we'll go back to the sample size then. What was the number that you went for and why was that number the best number for your research? So, again, I had ideas of the sample I was going to have and, it, you know, I'd worked with local organisations and started, you know, to build up those relationships. And I was going to volunteer in a local job centre, but 
that all got derailed. Um, so in the end, I used social media recruitment and the sample was uh, 13 people. But because I did uh, multiple interviews, it ended up with 37 interviews in the end. And then in terms of ethics, then um, yeah. we know that ethics approval, I mean, based on what we've seen on the Internet and Twitter, people have their opinions. Um, what was the process like applying for and, you know, your, your ethics form to be approved mm. and and also the, the paperwork that you had um, in terms of your sample size that you shared in terms of the letter, the coding, et cetera. What was the process like for those who were just thinking, I'm really nervous and I, I've received three DMs actually about the process and to say can I look at your work so what mm -hmm. advice do you have for somebody who's quite nervous? Um, so, I ha I ha so the first ethical application went straight through and it was okay um, the second one which I had to do because I changed my style from face to face to um to phone interviews took a lot longer and it was quite difficult um but the first thing i would say is reach out to supervisors for support um because mine were really instrumental with that um and just thinking about exactly what you want to do and why you want to do it and and you know go into the literature and thinking about how you can justify it's really important um and be prepared for feedback on your ethics application it's that's totally okay and normal even though at the time you may not feel that way um but it's just part of the process and I think it, it does make you a better researcher. No, I agree and then in terms of ethnography um, yeah. you've touched on it and you know I guess the question that I always ask is how does your research benefit the wider community and you've touched on it to say you know you are a part of the community as well so could you please take me through that in terms of how it benefits the community and what inspired you um, to go down this path um, to say there is a need and we need to focus on this research and I want a positive change or maybe I just want to, to to give a voice to the voiceless what is the passion mm -hmm. so I think for me when I started looking at the research universal credit had sort of started to be rolled out in a lot of areas and I was really interested to see sort of the impact of that because it was you know it's such a big change well it's not a ch it's like a continuation of what's changed um but the approach is is quite different the online aspect um you know applying without support that is it's quite different although it's a continuation um so I was really really interested in that um and I think when I initially went into this I'd, I really hoped it would change policy I had sort of that very macro level um you know view on on the impact I do think that's probably narrowed down a bit more now you know now I've been doing it for a few years um but I think it's really important to have those conversations and put the research out there for others and I think as well with this research you don't really see a lot of longitudinal studies in terms of universal credit I know there's been more research out there but I haven't really seen that longitudinal detail and I think uh, doing it during the pandemic is really interesting because we saw what would happen when there was temporary policy changes and we saw sort of the outcome and people still struggled. Um, so I think that's really important to, to sort of assess and, and look at. Um, and I think the focus on universal credit, um, we're, we're going in, you know, a cost of living crisis. Um, people are struggling a lot. There's a lot of changes in, in the labour market. Uh, and also alongside that, um, it's not been fully rolled out yet, but it is going to be by 2024. So everybody who's on working tax credits, um, income support, everybody's going to be moved over to this. So I think it's really important to have those conversations um, and look at, you know, why we're doing it this way and, and what the impact is on people. No, um, thank you so much. Um, and it moves me on to the next question, which is mental health. Um, mm. You know, in, in regards to I know finances, they, they can trigger mental health um, challenges if you don't have money. So if we're looking at individuals who are currently, you know, in the welfare system, what's your take and what advice do you have for um, DWP, for example? That's the only <laughs> one I know. Um, for example, um, in regards to how they can, you know, best approach you know the group and also how they can help them even if they are back in work after 
you know they've you know they've gone through the process because it's it's it can be quite challenging to 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 move over from universal credit to to working life and dealing with the challenges in terms of working life and then sometimes you end up going back to universal credit so what what advice do you have there mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think that's a really interesting one. Something I just didn't really uh, mention before, but I'll just touch on it now. Um, so what's really interesting as well about universal credit is before there was sort of six legacy benefits that people would move around on if they were in work or out of work. But universal credit is for people in work and out of work. So it's like one, it's supposed to be one universal benefit. So what we found is that people would move on to work, but it would be low paid in secure work. So they still need universal credit. It's, it's quite rare for people to actually completely leave the system. Um, and I think with with mental health, um, I think that's a really, really interesting and really uh, good question, because especially with the fallout of the pandemic, people are, st are still struggling now. Um, and my sample, um, eight people had sort of mental health conditions. Um, and I think it's really challenging. Um, a lot of people were really concerned about getting back into work or they wanted work where they could be their own boss um, that would be flexible. Um, and I think it's it's a real challenge when, you know, they're setting really restrictive targets to get people back into work within a certain number of weeks. Um, I think since the pandemic, it's like 13 weeks or something now. And I think if you've got long term um, mental health challenges or disabilities, that's really challenging. It's not really flexible um, to be able to, to manage with that. Um, so I think a compassionate approach is needed. Um, but realistically, I'm not sure that the resources or, you know, the state is really interested in, in that approach. No, um, that's quite interesting. And I guess it, 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 it moves me on to, to current situ, which is, um, you know, we've seen on the news and, and I'll pick on London. Um, you know, there are people who are working really good jobs and, you know, you've said that it is universal. And yet at the same time, they are homeless and they're going to food banks just to survive. Mm -hmm. So when I'm looking at that situation, to me, that is very dire. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to understand in regards to where are we when it comes to universal credit and that group in particular that's working. And, you know, they're still having to rely on food banks and also on universal credit if they can get it or maybe they don't qualify because of the salary that they earn in London as you know you know it can yeah. be different so what's your take on that? I think a lot of it stems from um, the the you know there's I think there's broader questions there isn't there about sort of wage increases you know we're seeing a lot of people on strike at the moment um, because the living conditions aren't aren't enough um, so I think with universal credit, um, it, it fills a it fills a gap, doesn't it? Um, it allows um, corporations and businesses to con continue that low paid insecure work, and it sort of fills that gap. So maybe I mean this is really idealistic, but we need to look at that and and look at why people who are on a good wage can't afford to live. And I I don't even think universal credit is the solution. I think we need you know something bigger. Um, but I don't know. I think that's quite idealistic. I'm not too sure what universal credit can do for those people. Maybe they should um, hire the threshold for people who are who are still struggling. Um, and it should sort of pick up that slack. But I do think a lot of the fault lays with the corporations who, you know, the, the wages aren't rising with inflation. OK, so, OK, this is your three minute pitch to the corporations because you've done this research and, you know, yeah. you know more than I do. So what's your advice to to all these multinationals, um, you know, that are in the UK when, it, when you when we're looking at the national living wage, the minimum wage? And also, you know, in terms of salaries, current situ and the strikes and everything that's going on, what 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 would your advice be? And you've got like three sentences. <laughs> okay, no pressure. One, None one. at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, pay people a decent living wage. Go above the living wage. Um, a happy a happy workforce is, you know, a well fed workforce. Um, so my my pitch would be pay people. What, what they deserve, what they should be getting, take a smaller cut of profit, which they're never going to do, but, you know. <laughs> yes, members of parliament, we're coming for you. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Stop giving them a pay rise in parliament, but, you know. 
<laughs> That's it. <laughs> so, you know, in terms of, um, you know, the the overall then, the, the recommendations that you had when you finished your, your thesis, and mm. I know you've gone to a conference as well, um, you know, we're going to dive into that as we're rounding off. What were the two key bullet points that you think are important and someone needs to go in there and start working on it and write some papers mm -hmm. to, to push the vision, the mission, and to get the, the, you know, the information out there to say we need a change and, you know, we need it for the better, essentially. Mm. So I think the first one is sort of this idea of social reproduction. So um, a lot of the, my participants, it was mostly women. Um, and we saw sort of historically, if you look at sort of the post-war period, um, there was an emphasis on the importance of caring, caring for families and households. And with universal credit, that's very much changed. You're expected to uh, work a certain number of hours a week and also be a parent. It's not really valued in the same way. Um, but I think if that's the approach they're taking, they really need to develop um, a stronger way of managing the childcare. So making that flexible grant available to everybody as soon as they go into work so they're not getting into debt is the first one. Um, the second one is, um, I definitely have another one. <laughs> it's gone. No, I just, I, that's okay. What we'll do is we'll come back to it. Okay, okay. Yeah. So I, I, I like what you've you've just said. And I guess in terms of the conference, because you know, you, you've gone to a conference and mm -hmm. you presented a paper, didn't you? Oh um, poster, poster. A poster. Yeah. 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 So could you take us through that? There's somebody out there at home who's thinking, I've never been to a conference, you know, they said I have to present a poster. Um, what do they do? What well, you know, preparation and mm -hmm. also, you know, you do win um awards there as well, you know, for the best poster, etc. There's different awards, I think different conferences work differently. But if you can just take us through that process um so that people at home know. Yeah, of course. Um, so if, during the post, I did it on Microsoft PowerPoint, um, just did some little boxes um, and then you can just edit the size of the PowerPoint so it will it will print out. Um, sometimes you have to print it out quite far in advance, so like two weeks in advance and so be prepared for that time uh, so you're not panicking at the end. Um, and I think for me, what I wanted to do with my poster was create a conversation. So I wasn't trying to put everything about all my research on there, but I wanted to put some key bits and not overload it because I think that can be quite easy to do. You know, you want everything on there, but I kind of approached it as I want people to ask me about this, you know, and have a conversation. And um, that was sort of how I did it. And I had like my question at the top and just a couple of key findings. So it wasn't, you know, over overloaded. Yeah, I, I like that approach. I want a conversation. Mm -hmm. That is quite different from what we know as the norm. Um, you know, we want to put everything in there, don't we? And yeah. we want everybody to be like, wow, a amazing. But you want a discourse to which people could pick your brain and also you could think and, you know, and, and realise the current situation from other people's perspectives. Was that the, the drive to yeah. see what people would say so you could learn more and also put more into your research? Yeah, definitely. Cool? And sort of practice for the vibe, you know, being asked of that you don't know. <laughs> yeah, love it. Love it. No, that's, that, that, that is an amazing approach. So I will. I like that. And it, it's just um, interesting to, to hear that perspective. And I hope someone else, you know, adopts it and, and, and takes it forward. So in regards to your current situation, you've mentioned your, your Viva as well. Um, what is the prep like? Because I there's somebody who had theirs and they asked me for, for some advice, but it's always nice to hear, you know, from other people. So what is the prep like um, beforehand? So I don't have the date for mine yet, so I can't answer that. Um, uh, to be honest, I'm just I'm just ignoring it. Really, that's probably not the great advice. Yeah. Um, at the moment, I'm just waiting till I get my date, and then I'm gonna. I'm probably only going to spend about two weeks on it because I feel like you can spend a lot of time, and I think if you go in there with too much, you know, you can overload yourself. So I think my approach to prep is going to be a couple of hours, maybe an hour or two every day for two weeks. 
um, and try not to stress myself out and let it take over my life because it, again it's going back to that conversation I feel like it is a conversation um, and it's okay if you don't have all the answers I think you know when we were PhD students we we're always frightened of not having the answers but that can also be a good thing but then you know who knows how I'll feel nearer the time. <laughs> Good luck. Hopefully this has helped our discuss today. Hopefully um, it's helped you, you know, just to think as well and say, oh, actually, I didn't think about that. But yeah, that's great. And I guess, uh, you know, one of the last questions when it comes to your research before we move on to the questions um, as we're rounding off is I've been thinking and, you know, I know that this is personal to you and you, you, you know, you, you are passionate do you think there are blurred lines in regards to your research because it is personal and you have understanding you know what the process is like um do you think that tailored you in 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 in, in a way in regards to your own research findings and recommendations um at all yeah so i think that's a really good point and sort of going back to the idea of autoethnography um my approach it definitely has um but i think the way i've sort of navigated that is is i've been up front with it sort of in my methodology um i've said this is from my positionality you know i'm a member of that group so obviously it's going to be relevant to sort of through my my lens and way of seeing things so someone else might find something different but i actually think that's a strength i think if i'd done the research and not adopted sort of an autoethnographic approach and sort of reflected on it then I think that would be different um but I think because I've been transparent it's been really useful but I do think it was really hard um this blurring of the lines but again I think that's where your supervisors come in because they will come in and they will comment and feedback on certain parts you know so they will view it differently um so I think that's been really really useful to do okay and I guess, you know, I, I like the fact that you've said, you know, the, your supervisor played um, a, a key role. For those who say my supervisor is not supportive, mm -hmm. um, you know, I can't have what you have. What advice do you have for them um, just just on that point? Mm, I, th I, th I think that's really tricky if you haven't got a supportive supervisor but I guess one way to, to sort of navigate that would be to approach peers um, you know other PhD students get their take on things um, or, or other people that you might know in the department it might be useful to, to ask others or others sort of interested in similar topics as you um, I think just getting feedback in general is really really useful um, with issues like that no, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I guess, you know, the, the other thing, um, you, we, we did a bit of research on you, um, is you are an active supporter of women's rights. And you've mentioned, um, again, not to pick on your work, that it was okay. mostly women. So I know that there's single parents who are men, <laughs> yeah. you know, in the UK. So I'm just mm. wondering, you know, was it because you know you're a big you know pusher of women's rights that's why you didn't have a lot of men in your sample okay. or is it because you know people you know just related to you on socials because you're a woman as well and they said mm -hmm. you know we'll respond back so what's your take on that that's a really interesting point so so my sample was uh, 12 women and, and one man um so i think that's really interesting i think if you sort of look at the data out there as well especially on social media it is more women that respond so I, I, I don't know maybe I'm naturally drawn to that sample that potentially but um, I did sort of go into it wanting a real mix of people um, and and that sort of didn't happen um, so I, I'm not too sure really because even when I was sort of recruiting online it was always women responding and I tried to reach different groups um, I, I think there can be harder groups to reach, maybe because I am a woman, I don't know. Just asking, it's just yeah. one of those questions. Yeah. <laughs> it's just... 
So yeah. in terms of the living crisis as well, I know that you, you, you've got a voice um, in terms of social media then. What's your current take in terms of current situation and how best do you think we can help ourselves? And mm. uh, I have a passion because I'm looking at students, you know, um, when it comes to um, the student loans for undergrads, that is, they've remained mm. the same, really. Mm. Um, nothing's mm. changed in terms of more income. And mm. I know the universities, they're given, you know, students bursaries here and there ad hoc. Mm. So what What's your take on that? Because I feel like the the younger generation that will go into employment and at the mm. moment there are a lot of redundancies, businesses mm. are packing up. Mm. So the future doesn't look bright. And then the housing market, oh my gosh, you've seen on the news as well, mm. inflation. Mm. And you know, we are a generation that's used to travels as well in terms of mm. socials, you know, you've seen hashtag um catch flights, not feelings. But then mm. when we're looking at our current situation personally I think it's not good for our mental health because the mm-hmm. things that we prioritized or the things that were sold by the media we just genuinely cannot afford so mm-hmm. what's your take on everything that I've just gone through it's like a big pot of cooking in it <laughs> so the first thing is we need a general election <laughs> that's the first thing second thing everyone needs to vote <laughs> when that happens um and you know get get active in the communities I think is is a really key thing um also yeah I think what you're saying about sort of as, 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 yeah, my take from that was sort of aspirations and I think our generation has very much changed like I've come to terms with the fact I'm never going to own a house you know I'm a single parent on a good wage it's just not going to happen and then when you see people that are already in that position and inflation's going up so their mortgage is going up and they they can't afford it and there's two wages you just think okay so that that reality that life we've all been sold is not accessible for most of us now or it might never be so it, I think it is a, a difficult one but then it's how we manage in the meantime um mm-hmm. and sort of what you're saying about the student loans as well you know cost of living's gone up hasn't it people's rent has gone up um and people are really struggling and I do think institutions could do more to support people it shouldn't take someone saying they're experiencing hardship to be able to offer that support I think financially there should be more support available for students because like you say they're going to be the future workforce as well no thank you very much and I guess for um the last few questions um you know which is I I do get a few questions and I always like to ask um because it's not my opinion then it's like the community is contributing um (laughs) The first question is um, in regards to publishing. Do you feel fulfilled when you publish an article? That's a really good point. Um, I haven't actually published any articles yet. I I did a policy briefing with my supervisors and we've got one sort of under review. Um, So I I can't really, really answer that um, as such because I haven't got articles published yet. Um, But I think one of the takeaways from that is so I'm writing some things is I think it's fulfillment of sharing ideas um and sort of have it again inviting those conversations um I think that's a fulfillment and for me as well with my research it was really great to sort of speak to people in the community and and see sort of their experiences as well um I think that's where the fulfillment comes from for me no, I like that. Thank you. And I guess um, this one as well, which was my PhD supervisor advised his friend not to hire me as a postdoc. What should I do? Wow. OK. Very ethical, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I had um, to give breath away, literally. <laughs> I mean... I don't really know what to say to that. Um, I would say look elsewhere if you can. And I know it's it's a hard market out there. Um, but, you know, obviously that's not a nice thing to hear. And, uh, you know, um, I think it can be really tricky navigating those sort of relationships. Um, I would try to move on from that and see what else is out there and just keep applying. I, I applied for about 30 jobs before I got mine, you know, had seven interviews. So I would say keep keep applying and don't get too disheartened. And, you know, maybe they're just not a fit for you and that, that's OK. No, I like that. Thank you. And also um, the other question, which is in regards to, um, you know, mental health, um, pre-pandemic, 
during the pandemic and post pandemic but we know that universities they've um you know worked really hard to ensure that we've had the support but in your opinion do you think more can be done just based on some of the the tweets that we see and some of the inboxes that I do get where people feel like they want to resign from their PhD and they feel like they're constantly under pressure to publish, to attend conferences, to to work in the labs and perform, you know, at a really, really high rate. What's your take on that? Mm. I think that's really interesting, especially for PhDs, sort of the mental health, it's it's higher than the most professions, really. Um, and I, th I think it's really hard to navigate. And I do think um, I think universities really struggle because obviously they have undergraduate students as well. And I, I think sometimes they need more resources to be able to, to manage that um, because it, it is it's quite challenging. Um, and I think in terms of quitting, I, I don't really have any advice other than I felt like that all the time. So I do think that is, you know, maybe quite normal to feel like that because it is a journey. It's always full of ups and downs. And I think sort of the the pressure to perform, I think that's just academia in general, isn't it? You know, there's so many things that are expected of you. And I think for me, what I've tried to do is focus on what I can do in the present. I think when we think too far in front, we, we can get overwhelmed. Um, which is probably why I don't have many, you know, publications. But um, it's just looking at what you can do in the now, I think, is what's worked for me. No, I love it. Thank you very much. And I guess the, the other question is, in your opinion, and I've asked this question um, in, you know, in regards to breaking the poverty cycle. Do you think education breaks the poverty life cycle um, in terms of generational or do you think actually it, it doesn't do anything anymore it's not prestige you know because everybody's mm -hmm. like got a degree or a PhD mm -hmm. now it just doesn't make a difference what's your what's your take I think that's a, a really good point obviously more people are getting degrees now um but for me it definitely has broken that cycle so mm -hmm. it's it's a really tough one because it's very competitive and it's it's very difficult but education has changed my life you know I'm not the same person who went in to university I'm not the same person at all and it has changed you know I never would have gone you know I, I went to South Korea I never would have gone there I went to Berlin you know things I would never have had access to yeah. so I, I do think it can but then I'm a cis white straight woman do you know what I mean so yeah. I, I think I think it very much depends and some of its luck some of it's who you meet along the way mm -hmm. as well I think that does make a big difference I've been you know really fortunate to have great mentors and, and supervisors so I, I think it's also those sort of connections that you make as well. Yeah, no, thank you very much um, for your response. And I guess the final question you'll be glad to know, and I think you're tired now, is um, do you think PhD Hard Talk is beneficial for researchers and also for universities um, in, in the sense of what we're doing now, do you see any added value or do you think normal call it a day? That's it, it's not working. <laughs> Assessment. <laughs> okay, that's a really great question. No, but um, I, I do think it's really valuable um, because, you know, as when you're doing a PhD, it can be quite lonely and isolating and you do spend a lot of time searching for, oh, what's this person done or how have they done this? So I think having that resource um, out there in the world is really beneficial um, and I think maybe it could be beneficial for universities as well because they they might not necessarily always see sort of the detail that PhD students go through um, so I think that could be useful for though for them as well. Thank you very much so we've come to the end of our talk however to the audience at home so Robin literally is a lecturer at Dover University I think it's criminology if I'm wrong you may correct me but all the details will be at the bottom in regards to her work conferences that she may be attending um, in the near future when this goes live and if you do want to get in contact her contact details are at the bottom however if she doesn't respond she's really busy give us some time <laughs> <laughs> we have to be kind. Um, remember, hashtag project dissemination to the world, hashtag sustainable knowledge to the world. And thank you so much, um, Robin, for your time. Thank you.